not follow us at once, as anyone would have done, seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They might have been formulating a response that looks like repentance. And we've given them plenty of time. Should we go back? I wonder if they're still there. Then they may look at us. What better way to torture them than with what they cannot touch? Shall we also preserve a dignified silence? Oh, certainly, it's the only thing to do now. This dignified silence seems to produce a most unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing, I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did she pretend to be my guardian's brother? Hmm. So I would have the opportunity to meet you. <laughs> that seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear. If you can believe him. Well, I... I... I don't... But that doesn't take away from the wonderful beauty of his answer. <laughs> True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, what explanation can you provide to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you may have the opportunity to come and visit me as often as possible? Well, uh, can you doubt that? That's very bad. <laughs> I, I have my greatest, gravest doubts on the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for skepticism. Explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. 
I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires absolute credulity. <laughs> then, do you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True, I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Uh, can we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take time for me? Certainly. Your Christian names are still a great barrier. That is all. That is all. Are Christian names? But that's nothing. We were going to be christened this afternoon. For me, you are prepared to do this terrible thing. Uh, I am. Uh, and to please me, you're ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. <laughs> Darling! Uh, 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 <laughs> Gwendolyn! What does this mean? Uh, Lady Paracnal. You! Come here immediately! Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young and physical weakness in the old. A prize served my ward's sudden flight by her trust he made. Whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I tracked her phone all the way here. <laughs> My unhappy husband is, I am glad to say, under the impression that she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the university extension scheme on the influence of a permanent thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. Indeed, I have never undeceived him on any questions. <laughs> I would consider it wrong. But of course, you will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my ward must cease immediately from this moment, on this point. As indeed on all points, I am firm. Well, Gwendolyn and I are engaged, and on that point, I am firm. You are nothing of the kind, and now it's for God's Algernon, Algernon! Yes, yes, perhaps Augusta, yes. May I ask, is this the house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh. Bunbury? Yes. Reside here? No, 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 no. Bun Bunbury doesn't reside here. Uh, Bunbury is um, somewhere else at the moment. And in fact, Bunbury is um, dead. Dead? What did, what, what did Mr. Bunbury die? I, 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 well, I, I killed him this afternoon. He died this afternoon. But what did he die of? Um, 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 he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, it exploded! Exploded! I, I mean, he was found out. Bunbury's found out. The, the doctors found out that he could not live, so Bunbury died. He seems to have had great confidence in this opinion of his physicians. I am glad, however, that he made up his mind at least to use some definite course of action. An accident of proper medical advice. And now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, hmm. may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Elginon is holding? What seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner. That young lady is my ward, Miss Cecily Cardew. I am engaged to be married to Cecily. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. I do not know whether there is anything exciting in the air of this particular part of Illinois, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part would not be out of place. 
So, <laughs> Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the large railway stations in Chicago? I merely desire information. Until yesterday, I had no idea that there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the daughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of Cardew Parker, now Parker Worthing Investments. Oh, that sounds not unsatisfactory, but what proof am I of your statement's authenticity? The last will and testament of Mr. Thomas Cardew, which I can have opened for your perusal, Lady Bracknell. Oh, I have known many a will to be altered after a passing. Well, then I suggest you talk to her family solicitors, Mark B. Mark B. and Mark B. They can clear up any confusion you have. Well, Mark B. Mark B. and Mark B. Mm. Home of the highest position in their profession. So far, I am satisfied. You may continue. How kind of you, Lady Bracknell. Well, if I may continue, I have also under my possession the certificates of her baptism, graduation, vaccinations for measles, mumps, chicken pox, a letter of recommendation from our pastor for her community service, a article which she wrote for our local paper, and if you insist upon it, the COVID-19 vaccination as well. Ah. I like crowded with the incident oh. I see, though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I have knocked myself in favor of premature experiences. When the land the time approaches for our departure, we have not a moment to lose. Oh, as a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. I regret to tell you that it is only her father's. Funds and investment portfolios that will be transferred to her upon her coming of age. But that is all, so unfortunately, you will have to leave, as I am sure you will not approve of that, Lady Bracknell. So nice to have seen you. Investment and funds. Oh. Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady. Mm. Now that I look at her, few girls at the present day have any real solid qualities of any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of surfaces. Come over here, dear. Pretty child. Oh, your dress is dreadfully simple, but your hair seems almost as nature meant it to be. But we can soon alter that. A very experienced French maid, perhaps a, oh, a really marvelous result of very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Mrs. Lansing, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. <laughs> and after six months, uh, nobody. Oh. Kindly turn around, young child. Mm, no, the side view is what I want. There you go. Oh, yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points is our age as what it's want, principal and it's want of profile. Now the chin a little higher. I, I, higher, higher, there we go, dear. Now, style largely depends on the, whole, the way the chin is worn. They're worn very high, just at present. Out and on! Uh, yes, Aunt Augusta? There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Carter's profile. Well, Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the world, and I don't care a bit about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. Dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend on, but I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind, but I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I... I must give my consent. <laughs> thank you, Aunt Augusta. Yes, thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may address me as Aunt 
Gusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favor of long engagements. They gave people the opportunity to find out each other's characters before marriage, which I think is never advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age, and I absolutely decline. Upon what grounds, my I ask? <clears throat> Elginard is extremely, I, I may almost say, an exceptionally unbelievable young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? Well, it pains me to have to speak frankly to you about your nephew, Lady Bracknell, but I don't approve of his moral character. I find him to be the most untruthful person I've ever met. Untruthful? Yeah. My nephew? Well, yeah. impossible. He went to Harvard. Well, I fear, even though he went to Harvard, there can be no possible doubt about the matter. For this afternoon, while I was out, he obtained access to my house under the false pretense of being my brother. He attempted to seduce my ward, which I told him he had no permission to do. He then entered my house, opened my only bottle of Perrier Jure 89, which I was saving for this year's New Year's Eve party. He raided my fridge, let out the smoked aged Gouda, which then molded, and furthermore, in pretending to be my brother, he gave the most falsified information ever, for he knew I had no brother. There was no brother I never intended to have, nor do I ever want a brother of any kind whatsoever. He knows so. I told him so yesterday afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, <throat> after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. How very charitable for you, Lady Bracknell. My own decision, however, is unalterable. I refuse to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? Well, I'm really only 20, but I always admit to 23 when I go to evening parties. Oh, you're perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 20? But it's bidding to 23 at evening parties. Well, it won't be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me, Lady Bracknell, from interrupting you. Again? But it's only too fair to tell you that in accordance with her father's will. Miss Carter doesn't come of age till she's up. Thirty-five. Oh, that does not seem to be a grave objection. Thirty-five is a very attractive age. Chicago society is full of women of the very highest birth to have of their own free choice. Remain thirty-five for years. Mrs. Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not be still even more attractive at this age. You mentioned that she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algie, could you wait for me until I was 35? No, I could, Cecily. Yes. Yes, I, I felt it instinctively, but I couldn't wait all that time. I can't wait five minutes for anybody. I know I'm not punctual myself, but I do admire punctuality in others, and waiting even to be married is, is quite out of the question. Then oh. what's to be done? I don't know, Mr. Moncrie. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Scardu states positively, 
that she cannot wait till she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to so a uh, somewhat impatient nature, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. My dear Lady Bracknell, you seem to be under the notion that I'm in control when the decision is entirely in your hands. For the moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will be glad to allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Oh, well then a passionate celibacy is all any of us have to look forward to. Well, this is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five or six trains. If we miss any more, we might be exposed to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christening. The christenings is not that somewhat premature. Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Oh. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that this was the way you, which you, which you, 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 you wasted your time and money. Uh, I do understand that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon. I don't see how christenings could be of use to either of us at this present moment, Pastor Jocelyn. I am very grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Wood. Such views savor of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have soundly refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. Uh, however, as your current mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Uh, I've just been informed by the pew opener that for the past hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism! Yes, Lady Did Prism. I hear you mention Miss Prism? Yes, I am on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this, Miss Prism, a female of a repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies with a very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? <laughs> I am celibate, madam. Uh, Lady Bracknell, Miss Prism, holds a place in my household. She is Miss Cardew's esteemed companion and most admirable tutor. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Better be sent for, right now. She approaches. She's nigh. Yes, Mr. Chasuble, I, I was told you were expecting me in the vestry. I have been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism! Prism. Twenty-four years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104 Upper 7th Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigation of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a novel of more than a usually revolting sentimentality, but the baby was not there. Prison, where is that baby? Oh, 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 oh. Pastor, help <laughs> Jam, 
Lady Bracknell, I must admit with shame that I do not know. I really wish that I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded in my memory, I intended, as usual, to take the baby out in its perambulator. I also had with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction, for which I can never forgive myself, I placed the manuscript in the bassinet and I placed the baby in the handbag. But where did you put the handbag? Oh, Mr. Worthing, do not ask me. I... Uh, Miss, 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 Miss Prism, I must. This is a matter of no small importance. Where did you leave the handbag? I left it in the cloak room of one of the larger railway stations in Chicago. To which railway station? Union. Gwendolyn, excuse me, I must go to my room for a moment. If you are not too long, I'll wait for you all my life. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect Pastor Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families in high positions, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. Uncle Jackson is strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. I wish you would arrive at some conclusion. The suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Miss, Miss Prism, is this, is, is this the handbag for Examine it before you answer the happiness of more than one person's life depends upon. Seems to be it. Oh. Here is the injury it suffered from the upsetting of a the Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier oh. days. Oh. Here is the stain it received from the exploding of a temperance beverage. The incident happened at Leamington. Oh. And here on the rock are my initials. I had forgotten that I had them placed there in an extravagant moment. <laughs> oh, I do believe it is mine. How exciting to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience living without it all these years. Well, um, this prism, more is restored to you than just that handbag. <clears throat> I was the baby you placed in it. <laughs> you? Yes! Mother! <laughs> Mr. Worthing! What? what? I am unmarried. Oh. Well, who? Uh, there. Uh, there. There is the woman who can tell you who you are. Oh. Uh. <clears throat> uh, Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you be so kind as to inform me, um, who I am? I am afraid that the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. <laughs> you are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's younger brother. Unfortunately, unhappy brother Cecily, 
my unfortunate brother Gwendolyn, my brother Algernon. You know Algernon? <laughs> you must treat me with more respect. You have never treated me at all how an older brother should treat his younger brother, and all the time I've known you. Well, not till today I admit, uh, though I uh, did my best. However, I was out of practice. <laughs> Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, hmm. except in my affections. Hmm. What a noble nature you have, Glenn. Well, then the question had better be cleared up at once. Um, I'll just for a moment. Um, when Miss Prism placed me in the handbag, had I already been christened? Yes, dear. Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your kind and doting parents. Oh, then I've already been christened. Great. Well, um, now that that is settled, what name was I given? Pray let me know the worst. Being the youngest son, you were christened after your father's youngest brother. Yes, but what was my father's younger brother's Christian name? Well, I cannot at the present moment uh, recall well, what the General's brother's Christian name was, but but I have uh, no doubt he had one. Uh, he was an eccentric, uh, I admit, but but only in the later years, and this was the result of you know marriage and. Yeah, 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 Algernon, can you recollect what our father's brother's Christian name was? Well, he, he died before I was a year old. We were never on speaking terms. <laughs> now, his name might appear in the army lists of the time, I would presume. Oh, the general's brother was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But, but I have no doubt he has a name. Uh, uh, his name would appear in any military directory, for he was a general. <laughs> okay. Army lists of the time, yes. Um, Maxim. Magley, Magley. Horrible names these are. Mark B. Mark B. Mark B. Mark B. Uh, Moncrief. Captain, second captain, lieutenant, second lieutenant, third lieutenant, general. <laughs> Ernest John. <laughs> well, you, you, you know? I said my name was Ernest, and naturally, it is Ernest. I mean, how could it be anything else? Look at me. <laughs> yes, I remember now that the general's brother's name was called Ernest. Well, well, I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. <laughs> Ernest! My own Ernest! I thought that from the first that you could have no other well, name. Gwendolyn, it's, it's quite a shock for one to realize they've been telling the truth all the time when they thought they were lying. <laughs> Can you ever forgive me? I can, for I know that you are sure to change. Oh, my love. <laughs> Frederick! Did you sure? At last! Cecily. Oh, at last. Oh, my nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. No, no. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I, 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 for the first time in my life, have finally and fully realized the vital importance being earnest.